Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to the mRNA application in Discovery and Development Digital Week, brought to you by the organisers of the TIDE conference series. Next year, we'll be visiting Kyoto in March, San Diego in May, and Amsterdam at the end of the year in October. My name is Michael Dunnett, and I'll be your host for today's session titled New Approaches for Liquid Nanoparticle Design and Microfluidic Manufacturing Enable RNA Delivery for Vaccines and CAR T-Cell Therapy. Our presenter today will be Dr. Samuel Clark from Precision Nanosystems, Director of Reagents. Welcome, Samuel. Great. Thank you, Michael, and, and good morning and good afternoon. And thank you, everyone attending, for your attention for this session. And so um, what I'd like to do in my talk is provide an overview of some of the technology that we've been developing at Precision Now. I'd like to focus on uh, scientific data and, how, and, and show how this technology can enable genetic medicines, including RNA vaccines and CAR T cell therapies. So I'll start with a quick introduction to Precision Nano. Um, Precision Nano was acquired by the Danaher Life Sciences Platform in June 2021. This includes companies such as PAL, Cytiva, Algebron, and IDT. And here, just a little bit more about Precision Nano Systems and our company. The company was founded in 2010 in Vancouver as a spin out from UBC. We provide end to end technology for nanoparticle-based genomic medicine development. Mm -hmm. Our customers include most of the top pharma and biotech companies across the world. We've also built a strong IP portfolio with more than 125 patents and patents pending. Our customers have published over 200 um, scientific articles using our technology and products. Mm -hmm. Finally, just wanted to highlight our, our headquarters in Vancouver, Canada. Uh, which is the, the image on the on the on the top, and then the, the image on the bottom is our our, our new GMP Biomanufacturing Center, which is currently under construction in Vancouver. And so here's an overview for my 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 scientific presentation today. I've broken it this into uh, four main sections. Um, I'd like to start with an introduction to some of the core technology that we've developed at the company, uh, especially with a, with a focus to our genboid lipid nanoparticle technology, as well as our nanoassembler microfluidic manufacturing platform. And then I'd like to move into a couple of case studies. So first I'll talk about um, how you can use this technology to help to develop gene edited CAR T cells with applications in cancer therapy. Uh, second case study I'll focus on is, um, is an RNA vaccine application where I'll show how this technology can be used to develop a, a format of, of um, RNA vaccines using uh, self-amplifying RNA technology. And finally, I'll, I'll finish with um, data and highlighting technology that we've developed that enables you to go from small-scale discovery work towards uh, scale up and, and process development in a very fast and, and convenient way. So that's the story I'd like to tell. And, um, uh, and, and so let's jump in uh, to the uh, initial technology introduction. So first of all, at Precision Nano, we believe geno genomic medicines are, are really the future. And um, it's really about treating disease at, at its fundamental level you know, we've seen how uh, single interfering RNA can be uh, used in therapies to silence proteins that cause disease. We've seen how messenger RNA can can be used in vaccines to express proteins that that leads to to protection against infectious disease. And we're seeing examples of how CRISPR and other gene editing technologies can be used to permanently edit genes. And so uh, this this type of nucleic acid toolkit is a very uh, powerful approach to to treat almost any disease that has a gene uh, genetic basis. And the applications are wide, from infectious disease to to rare disease and cancer. And 
so uh, genomic medicines, these genomic medicines, they're more than just the uh, nucleic acid um, because RNA and DNA, they're large molecules that require delivery technology to get into the right tissue itself. And so nanoparticles really help to solve this delivery challenge. Nanoparticles uh, protect the nucleic acid and deliver it to the cell cytoplasm. And they're fully synthetic and can be easily manufactured. So uh, from the perspective of developing a drug product, have some uh, really strong advantages. And nanoparticles can be used in different ways as, as, as therapies. Uh, we've seen some good examples in the uh, in vivo uh, category uh, in the last couple of years with the mRNA vaccines developed by Pfizer and Moderna for COVID-19. These are injected into the muscle. Uh, there are other therapies under development that can be injected IV or directly administered to, to the sinus disease. Another category that, that is... Um, uh, you know, has a, has a lot of opportunity is, is the ex vivo cell therapy area. Now, the concept is shown on the, on the right hand side here, where the uh, the patient's cells are uh, extracted. Uh, these cells are genetically modified to to uh, gain a therapeutic function, and then reinjected back into the patient for treatment. And so, we've seen examples over the last few years in the field of CAR T therapies. Uh, following this type of workflow using viral vectors to to uh, to be used to um, treat various forms of cancer, the results uh, have been quite remarkable, and and so where we see an opportunity now with um, genomic medicines and, and, and uh, nanoparticle based delivery is the potential to use nanoparticles in in this type of application, and so. Um, at Precision Nanosystems, we've been uh, focused on developing platform technologies that enable them to, and accelerate the development of genetic medicines. So we've developed three key platform technologies. The first is a genetic payload platform. This technology is based around the self-amplifying uh, messenger RNA. I'll give more examples of this when I get into some of the data. This technology is designed to express, express specific proteins. Our second core technology is our Genvoid delivery platform. These are lipid nanoparticles and, and ionizable lipid chemistries um, and developed for some of the key applications in the field. And finally, our third application is our nano assembler manufacturing platform. This is a microfluidic mixing technology uh, for, for really controlled uh, production of RNA lipid nanoparticles. This technology is highly scalable, which is one of the key advantages. It allows you to work on the microliter scale and a discovery setting and scale quickly to, towards a large volume of GMP production. And so overall, our, our, our goal with providing the, the genetic medicine toolkit into the field is to really to try and help accelerate the development of these new, new ge genomic medicines. So this slide describes our GenBoy lipid nanoparticle delivery platform in a little bit more detail. What we've developed is a proprietary state-of-the-art lipid nanoparticle technology, which comprises a, a library of novel ionizable lipids. These lipids have been designed uh, with, with chemical di diversity and for, for um, use in, in uh, key applications such as vaccines, gene therapy, and cell therapy. In addition to the ionizable lipids, we've developed novel compositions comprising the ionizable lipid and other components such as cholesterol hyperlipid stabilizers, where these compositions have been carefully optimized for, for the key applications. So when I get into a couple of my case studies, I'll, I'll give specific examples of, of these um, lipid compositions that we've optimized for, for an application. I'd also like to highlight our nano assemble platform in a little bit more detail here. This is the microfluidic manufacturing approach. And so um, I think what's important to, to understand with RNA lipid nanoparticles is that these are relatively large drugs, uh, typically around 100 nanometers in size and, and comprise a, a large number of molecules. So uh, in excess of 100,000 individual molecules. 
So this can be considered quite a complex drug product. And um, and with that, it's also important to consider how, how the uh, nanoparticles are formed. These nanoparticles form by a self-assembly process. You can see the schematic of this, this concept on the on the right-hand side here, where the, the idea is that the uh, RNA and lipids will self-assemble in solution to form the spherical uh, RNA lipid nanoparticle complex. And so with the self-assembly process, one of the key aspects is careful mixing. And so that, this is where we've developed our next-gen microfluidics, uh, really designed to control the mixing process of the RNA and lipids in a very careful and controlled way to enable reproducible production of lipid nanoparticles. And so our next-gen fluidics, a uh, concept of fluid design shown on the, on the, on the bottom left-hand side here, uh, enables the, the really controlled mixing of the um, lipids and solvent and the RNA in a nucleus solution. So that's our, our microfluidic manufacturing platform. And then um, before I jump into some of the data sets, I also wanted to um, uh, really just to give the picture of what the end-to-end -end manufacturing workflow looks like for these RNA lipid nanoparticles. And so th this, this slide describes some of the key unit operations. So I've talked about the RNA already as one of the key components. I've talked about the lipids and given an example of our Genboy platform. Also talked about the microfluidic mixing step. And so, so together, these will allow for production of these RNA LPs. But then um, in the general process, there's quite a few downstream steps, which include the inline dilution, a filtration process to purify excess ethanol from the solution. And so at large scale, this is typically done by tangential flow filtration. At smaller scale, sometimes done by ultra filtration or, or centrifugal filters or, or dialysis. These LMPs are also sterile filtered and, and, and formatted and finished into, into vials for the, for the end application. So important to keep that perspective in mind about the intent workflow as we, we start to get into some of the upcoming uh, data sets. All right, so that's um, that's a bit, that's the, the, the quick introduction to the core technologies. And, and now I'd really just like to shift gears and take a focus into into a couple of exciting applications. Um, where I'd like to start here is with gene-edited CAR T cell therapies. So I already introduced this concept of the um, autologous uh, uh, cell therapy approach where patient cells are extracted, genetically modified to become uh, therapeutically active and then are injected back into the patient. The opportunity we see with lipid nanoparticles is, is, how, is using lipid nanoparticles for that genetic engineering step. This is, um, would be to, to replace the, some conventional approaches in the field, which currently include viral vectors as well as electroporation. And so you can see the concept of a lipid nanoparticle addition is a, is, you know, potential for a very simple step here where you, you simply add the lipid nanoparticles to cells and culture. To, to modify them as you uh, as you wish, and then the the really the, the simplicity of the lipid nanoparticle me method and and the flexibility um, allows for uh, some potentially even much more sophisticated applications. And so the concept on the right hand side is we're showing a so called off the shelf uh, CAR T cell therapy or allogeneic cell therapy, where uh, you can imagine having cells from a donor which are gene edited to remove proteins associated with, with uh, graft versus host disease, and then further modified to, to express a therapeutic protein like the CAR construct. Um, and so, so this um, is potentially uh, fits very well with a lipid nanoparticle based approach where you can imagine simply adding multiple different lipid nanoparticles to yourself to start the program in this uh, more complex functionality. And so uh, we we're uh, really excited about the opportunity for the lipid nanoparticle, lipid nanoparticles to enable these type of complex engineered uh, cell therapies. So towards that, I'd like to share some data that our, our team has uh, uh, pulled together around these concepts. Uh, so, so first of all, we, over the last couple of years, we've, we've developed a, a product called the Genboy T-cell kit. This, this product is based on our Genboy lipid platform, 
and, and as part of the work to develop that product, we selected an LMP composition and optimized it for performance in, in human primary T cells. And so this data shows a snapshot of some of that optimization process where we can see with the T cell kit uh, on the left hand uh, 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 part of the graph, uh, demonstrating how we optimize that for potency and expression in this case of a, of a simple uh, reporter protein, green fluorescent protein. So taking that a step further now towards some of these therapeutic applications, our team has also uh, done a lot of work towards um, um, putting together our exemplary data sets. And so what I'll walk through are three examples here, starting with gene expression, where we'll show how we used the uh, Genvoy uh, T-cell kit to, to engineer uh, cells to express a CD19 car molecule. In the second step, we'll show examples of, of using the, uh, these LMPs for delivery of CRISPR components to, to do gene knockups of self surface protein receptors. And we've done examples, including a TCR receptor as well as CD52. TCR is one of those receptors associated with graft versus host disease and would be a common target that uh, um, is important to remove in those allogeneic type cell therapies. And finally, we'll, we'll, we'll take it a step further with the data and demonstrate this concept of being able to use multiple lipid nanoparticles to, to start to add um, and, and affect cells in multiple different ways to, to engineer this more complex function. So we'll show an example of both a gene knockout of the TCR receptor as well as subsequent car expression. And we'll, we'll measure some of the performance of these gene edited CAR T cells. Okay, so we can start with the example of, of demonstrating expression of that CAR molecule. And so in this case, we used a uh, second generation CAR construct. The design of this CAR construct is shown on the left hand side here. And um, we used the Genboy uh, T cell kit with a nanoparticle composition to encapsulate mRNA encoding for that construct. We used a fairly standard uh, T cell culture workflow where, where we, um, uh, we cultured human primary T cells activated them and expand them in standard cell culture media. And so this, this result is a comparison of the lipid nanoparticle delivery method with electroporation. And, um, and we can go through the results here, starting with transfection efficiency. So on the left hand side, we can see with the lipid nanoparticles, we generate great transfection efficiencies above 80%. So more than 80% of cells expressing that, that CAR uh, protein on the cell surface. That's an improvement over electroporation, which was about 60% transfection. We can also look to protein expression by, by photocytometry in the middle graph here, where we can see that lipid nanoparticles have uh, higher, um, higher numbers of, of protein expression, as well as a more homogeneous uh, level of protein expression. You can see that with the single peak in orange. And that's compared to electroporation, again, which, which has a little bit of a different profile. It's more heterogeneous and lower overall. Finally, we can look at viability. When we look at the lipid nanoparticles compared to the untreated cells, you can see there's no, no significant difference in viability. And when we look to electroporation, we can see a fairly significant drop in viability due to the electric shock of the cells. And so overall, um, this data highlights some of the key advantages that we see for lipid nanoparticles in this application. Um, one of the most important advantages is that you can get these high transfection efficiencies well, at the same time, maintaining high viability. So one doesn't come at the cost of another. And we think that's a really, um, really strong benefit of the nanoparticle-based approach. So let's move to the second example here. We'll, we'll, we'll demonstrate how you can use these lipid nanoparticles to do knockouts of self surface receptors. And so in this example, we, what we've done is we've taken the uh, Genboy lipid composition, we've encapsulated uh, Cas9 mRNA, together with the uh, uh, single guide RNA uh, targeting the uh, TCR receptor. And so um, uh, again, in a simple workflow, we added these lipid nanoparticles to activated human primary T cells and uh, measured the, um, the gene editing uh, efficiencies. So uh, this experiment, uh, starting on the left hand side, shows a, a dose response. As we add more LRPs, we looked to, to the knockout efficiency 
And so we can see with increasing concentration that we see uh, knockout efficiencies of that TCR receptor approaching 80%, so very high knockout efficiencies. And we can see that effect in the middle panel and with protein expression, where we can see the TCR positive peak in, in gray. And then as we continue to dose higher with the lipid metacarticles, we see that strong reduction in that peak, indicating successful um, editing of, of that protein. Finally, uh, we can have a look at viability again and see that over that whole dose range, we maintain a very high viability of cells, again, showing that advantage of, of the lipid metal particle-based approach. And finally, in this, in this application, uh, I wanted to take it to that next step of showing multi-step engineering with lipid nanoparticles in, in, in cells. And so in this example and the, the workflow, what we show from left to right is uh, a first step of a TCR knockout. And that's with the addition of a single LMP. And the second step, a car expression with the addition of a second LMP. And then on the right hand side, we take that into an in vitro cell killing assay to show that these gene edited CAR T cells are functional. And so the data supports that, that this is working well at each of the steps. You can see on the TCR knockout side that we're getting, in this example, about 70% TCR knockout. We clean that up to about 95% uh, using uh, magnetic beads. Subsequently, adding the uh, LMPs for CAR expression, you get. Um, uh, over 70% uh, of those TCR negative cells expressing the CAR. And then in, in vitro cell killing assay, what we did was we took these gene edited CAR T cells and we incubated them with a, a B cell cancer line and looked to, to measure uh, the specific lysis. And so that we can see that at a couple of different effector ratios, uh, we're able to see specific lysis in excess of 80%, overall showing that these um, LMP modified. Um, gene edited CAR T cells are, are um, working very effectively and, and have uh, 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 you know, some therapeutic function. So that's all the data I have on the, on the, on the, on the cell therapy application. Um, really just wanted to uh, use this as an example of what we think is possible using LMPs in cell therapies. Uh, so just the flexibility and the simple workflow um, could potentially enable some really uh, unique and sophisticated uh, genetic engineering of cells. And so we're really excited to see that the field can go with, with all of this. So next I'll move into uh, the second case study where I'll take a focus on, on RNA vaccines and in particular uh, technology called self amplified RNA. And, and we'll use the COVID-19 as a, as, a, as a therapeutic model in, in this case study. So first, I'll just start off with a little bit more here about the concept in, of the self-amplifying technology. So this slide shows the um, general concept of how a self-amplifying messenger RNA vaccine works. In the first step, that uh, self-amplifying RNA synthesized from a DNA template, encapsulated in LMPs. That's similar to uh, the concept for a conventional RNA. In a vaccine context, these, these the LMPs are injected into the muscle and um, and, and the um, RNA is delivered into the cytoplasm cells. And then in the third step here, this shows the, the characteristic of the self-amplifying technology, which is a little bit unique because the, the self-amplifying RNA encodes for proteins that amplify the target RNA in the cell. And so this amplification effect um, has the, has the great potential to, to improve the potency of these types of drugs and um, with potential uh, to, to increase potencies of up to 10 to, to 100 times um, com compared to that of some of the conventional RNA vaccines. So that's the overall concept in cell and messenger RNA vaccines. And so we've gone and taken, taken this model and, and um, uh, gone through a data set here to, to show how we can start to do some of the discovery and preclinical work to to develop uh, some lead vaccine candidates. And so I'll data that, that walks through three major steps here. Uh, first step being production of those RNA lipid nanoparticles. In this case, we'll use our Genva Allen product that's been designed for in vivo applications and, and our Ignite um, instrument, which I'll give more details on. So in that first step, we'll produce the nanoparticles and also um, demonstrate some of the analytical characterization 
then the second step will take those those nanoparticles into in vitro studies to to, to evaluate the um, in vitro toxicity as well as protein expression to confirm that the the RNA molecules are functional and biologically active. And then the third step will go towards in vivo studies in mice, where we'll look at um, both in vivo distribution and protein expression, as well as uh, results of immunogenicity studies. And so production of these um, lipid nanoparticles using the uh, nanoassembler microfluidic instruments is, is straightforward. Uh, it involves the combination of the, or the mixing of the lipid phase, which is lipid and ethanol, the nucleus phase, which is the RNA in a buffer, mixing through the, the next-gen microfluidic technology to produce that RNA with the nanoparticle. The typical critical quality attributes that we look for in, in, good, um, in good vaccine candidates and good, good lipid nanoparticles are a lipid nanoparticle size below 100 nanometers, polydispersive use below 0.2, near neutral data potentials and high encapsulation efficiencies. And some of the process parameters that we consider uh, optimizing at this step involve the flow rate ratio, total flow rates as well as the N to P ratio for the ratio of those lipids to RNA. All right, so we can get into to, to some of the data here and show some examples of that first step of actually producing these RNA lipid nanoparticles. In this example, we've used RNA described in the table here. These are self-amplifying RNA encoding for different genes of interest. So we have luciferase protein, green fluorescent protein, as well as SARS-CoV-2 uh, protein. These are self-amplifying RNA, so they're very large RNA molecules. So they range in size from about 8,000 nucleotides all the way to, to close to 12,000 nucleotides. And so with the data here, we can look at the size, the charge, and the encapsulation. And so the size on the left-hand side shows the size of the RNA with the nanoparticles with these different self-amplifying RNA. And so we can see the size is, is solar across the board with size of well, about 80 nanometers, low polydispersity below, below 0 0.2. Uh, and, and then also when we compare that to a control using a benchmark lipid called MC3, uh, for those of you not familiar, MC3 is a lipid that's in the clinically approved um, patro uh, uh, drug, which is uh, for, for uh, which is an SI RNA based drug uh, for treatment for liver disease. And so, using that as our benchmark control, we can see that the, the size of these um, RNA lipid nanoparticles, including for the self amplifying RNA, um, encapsulating the self amplifying RNA, are very similar in size, about 80 nanometers again, low polydispersities. So charge, we can look at the, the same samples and, and evaluate their surface charge. We can see that a slightly negative surface charge, which is what we expect based on the design of the, the components and solution. And encapsulations are high across all samples, um, uh, typically above 80%. So overall, these lipid nanoparticles um, using the genboid composition and meet these target attributes. These it's really critical quality attributes for an RNA vaccine. So next we can take those into um, in vitro studies. And so um, in this case, we're using HEC293 cells and we did a dose response experiment. And so starting on the left-hand side, we looked at viability. You can see that over the full dose range, um, cells are highly viable. And so, so no, no uh, issues with, with toxicity. We also looked at transfection efficiency. We can see those lipid nanoparticles um, utilizing the Genboa LM composition, you can see as you increase the dose, you start to see an increase in the signal of the protein expressed. In this case, we're using the GFP reporter protein to 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 measure uh, protein expression, and then and then and then protein expression on the right hand side. Now we're looking at the mean fluorescence intensity by flow cytometry, and we can see relatively high uh, protein expression across the full dose range. This is actually an interesting characteristic of the self-amplifying RNA, where even at very low doses, see a relatively high protein expression due to that self-amplifying nature. Okay, so those are our in vitro studies, and next we can move into in vivo studies and start to uh, get an understanding for the behavior of these lead, lead candidates uh, in vivo. And so this study is a biodistribution and protein expression study in mice. And in this study, we've compared um, 
to self-amplify RNA um, as well uh, uh, and, uh, as well as a, as a conventional RNA to, to highlight some of the differences in the protein um, expression behavior. And so we can see the actual images from the mice on the, on the left-hand side here in, in panel A. You can see with the, with the conventional mRNA, you, you get a very rapid expression, um, primarily focused in the muscle where the samples were injected. So in the short of six hours, you start to see this protein expression, and, and then, then this will um, decay over time. With the self-amplifying RNA, you start to see um, um, expression at, at later time points. And we can see these trends as we, we quantify them in the graphs in panel B. And so with the, with the conventional mRNA, we see that immediate strong uh, expression of the protein of interest and then a decay over time. And we looked at the 30 days in this example. And then, and then with the self-amplifying RNA, we see that um, you know, moderate initial intensity, which increases over time due to the self-amplifying nature and then a slow decay up to 30 days. So uh, an interesting difference here in the characteristic of the protein expression when we compare these two RNA technologies. All right, and then um, next we can um, start to, to get into, um, into the uh, vaccine application and, and, and this data is an example of an immunogenicity study we performed using the self-amplifying RNA encoding for SARS-CoV-2. And so the study design is shown on the left-hand side here. This was a prime plus boost scheme where we measured the uh, immune response using the ELISA at day 27 and at, uh, at day 42 following the, uh, following the boost. So the, the, immune, the, the response for um, SARS-CoV-2 specific IgG, total IgG are shown on, in panel A here where we can see with the genboy ILM composition, uh, we get uh, that nice um, strong immune response at day 27, which is further boosted at, at day 42. We can see similar results using the MC3 benchmark control. We also looked at the uh, ratio of the IgG uh, 2A versus IgG1, and um, we see uh, a slight skew uh, over one uh, to the IgG 2A, which is as expected. All right, and so uh, that's that's the the case study around um, uh, COVID nineteen vaccine, really leveraging this uh, Genboy ILM um, lipid library platform and the nanosimilar microfluidic approach uh, to to really quickly start to put together lead candidates for RNA vaccines that are effective in a in a preclinical context, and so uh, uh, really. Um, our, our goal with these technologies is to enable this type of work to be accelerated, to, to make it very fast and easy for for uh, people in the field to to get going and and start to to uh, identify um, lead candidates in their drug development programs. And so the uh, two examples I've walked you through um, around the uh, CAR T cell therapy and the vaccines that that work was all done at a relatively small scale. And so uh, where I'd like to shift gears here is focus on some technology that we've developed that will allow you to take these lead candidates and quickly start to scale up and do process development uh, to move to later stages of that drug development. And so this, this slide summarizes the, 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 the instruments that we've developed around our microfluidic manufacturing technology. Um, they, they're designed to really to support uh, drug development at all scales. So the discovery side, we have an instrument called Spark. Um, this was the instrument that we used primarily for the, um, the, the CAR T cell case study. And this allows you to produce microliter volumes of lipid nanoparticles and it's great for screening and early discovery work. Ignite is our next system up, which allows for production of, of RNA LMPs up to, up to about 20 milliliters, flow rates up to about 20 mils per minute. Ignite is the system we used to, to demonstrate the data for the COVID-19 vaccine. And then we developed uh, a technology recently called Ignite Plus, which extends the capabilities of this Ignite by allowing for, for production of material up to 60 milliliters, so larger batch sizes, as well it allows for increasing the flow rate up to 200 mils per minute. And, and that's important because these higher flow rates are 
are, are relevant for for the process conditions that are required when you when you go to much larger scales of GMP production. And so and so this this ignite plus is a very versatile system that can be used on the bench, allows you to do process development, and then it allows you to progress into larger systems quickly, including Blaze for, for late stage preclinical development, as well as our GAP systems designed for clinical production as well as production at commercial scales. All right, so we'll, we'll focus here on this Ignite Plus capability that we've enabled on the bench for, for process development. And so um, this, this slide brings us back to the concept of the microfluidic mixing, bringing together RNA and lipids in the microfluidic mixer to form the lipid nanoparticles. We can see from the microscope image here uh, using simple, simple colored fluids, just the concept for how that uh, fast and homogeneous mixing works, bringing together the blue and red fluids uh, mixing through the geometry of the microfluidic mixer uh, with uh, homogeneous um, uh, solution at, at the output. And so we've, we've applied this similar mixing geometry to on, 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 on several different um, mixing uh, cartridges, including the, the standard next gen, which allows for flow rates of up to 20 mils per minute, as well as uh, uh, next gen 500, which allows for flow rates up to 200 mils per minute. And so when we looked at flow rate titrations using a simple um, lipid nanoparticle composition for liposomes using POPC cholesterol, we can show that as we ramp up flow rates on these different mixers, uh, we, we reach the um, so-called limit size of the liposome of about 40 nanometers, um, both uh, with the next-gen mixer and then as well with the next-gen 500 mixer at higher flow rates of up to 200 mils per minute. And so to, to demonstrate how you can start to use this Ignite Plus system as well as the next gen 500 microfluidic technology in a process development setting, we designed a study uh, described on this slide to, to showcase some of these, these the capabilities. What we will be comparing in some of the upcoming data sets are um, lipid nanoparticles is that include, uh, include the um, self-amplifying RNA encoding for the SARS-CoV-2 protein. So the similar constructs that I demonstrated in the vaccine case study, uh, our, our genboid lipid nanoparticle, uh, in this case, a custom lipid mixture, and, and um, doing comparisons across the next gen at 12 mils per minute at a low flow rate compared to our next gen 500 at these higher flow rates, up to 200 mils per minute. And then within each of those, we'll be doing comparisons to different batch sizes. And we'll be doing comparisons of different downstream processing methods, which includes centrifugal filters as well as TFF. So that's the overall experimental design. And again, I'll walk through some data sets to show the differences and similarities in, 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 the, in the results that, that we achieve under these different process conditions. So the first slide here is a physical chemical characterization and nanoparticles produced under the four different process conditions. Again, these conditions uh, summarized in the legend on the right, but they're low flow, low volume, low flow, high volume, high flow, low volume, and high flow, high volume. And so we can see starting in panel A, the size, size is very similar across all process conditions. When you look at the post-sterile filtration step, you can see that the size is about 80 nanometers in all cases. Probably this person is below 0.2. Capsulation is very high across all process conditions, about 95% in this case. You can see that the loading as well is similar across all, all conditions. In this case, we also looked at lipid content of each of the samples prepared under different process conditions to confirm that the ratio of the, of the four components were, were the same. And so um, this, this result is from a UPLC uh, based. Um, uh, technique, and then you can see that the ratio of the ionizable lipid and this composition of DSVC cholesterol and DMG PEG 2000, we can see that the, the ratio of these four compositions is the same across each of the different process conditions. Finally, we looked at RNA integrity by capillary electrophoresis. And again, we can see that across all the process conditions, the RNA integrity is, is, is equivalent. So that's our physical chemical characterization of the nanoparticles produced at different scales and at different flow rates. We also took those two in vitro 
an in vivo study. So we can see here in, in the, in the top row in the in vitro studies, in this case, versus BHK570 cells, we did dose response curves for each of the four samples and observed a similar dose response and similar EC50 for each of those conditions. In this case, we're measuring the percent spike protein using ELISA. We also did an in vivo immunogenicity study, a study design is similar to the one that I walked you through in the uh, COVID-19 vaccine model and case study. And so we can see when we look to the total immune response, we can see a similar total immune response across the four samples. Uh, again, overall supporting that uh, the four samples uh, produced under different process conditions, a very similar physical chemical properties, as well as similar biological activity. And so, and so that's the, you know, really data to help support some of the new capabilities of this Ignite Plus system. Uh, what, what we're able to uh, accomplish with uh, moving towards um, higher flow rates and higher volumes is that it enables the production of more material. So as I mentioned with Ignite Plus up to 60 milliliters of, of undiluted sample. So that's enough material to start doing larger scale analytical development and larger scale in vivo studies to support your preclinical development. Importantly, it allows you to move to, to process flow rates at up to 200 mils per minute. These 200 milliliter per minute uh, process flow rates are, are clinically relevant and um, represent flow rates and process parameters that would be typical of, of production under uh, of, of large scale batches under GMP conditions. So by working on this Ignite Plus system uh, on the bench, you're, you're able to um, you know, really de-risk some of the later stages of, of developing and scaling up that, that drug. So that's one of the key advantages we see for the technology. Okay, and then, and then this is my final slide. And, and, and so I'd like to you know, come back to this picture of the end-to-end -end manufacturing workflow for an LMP-based gen genomic medicine. Um, we've, you know, talked about the um, uh, some of the, the core platform technologies that, that Precision Nanosystem offers, including the, the Genboy lipid nanoparticle reagents, next-gen microfluidic mixing, as well as a, a custom uh, RNA platform. As part of the Stanaher Life Sciences platform, we also uh, have companies in in, in our in our in the Danaher family that, that offer. Uh, even more technology that fills out this end-to-end -end workflow. So, that, so I'll dare run with the plasma and RNA capabilities, um, looking towards the downstream processing steps that Eva and Pal have um, excellent um, filtration technology, including tangential flow filtration technology that can be used for downstream processing of the nanoparticles. And, and so overall, really have um, a full suite of technology here that we're able to offer uh, to, to, to clients in, in field. And so that, that's overall my, my, my talk today. Uh, this, again, wanted to thank everybody for, for your attention and, and for attending. I also wanted to, to, uh, in, in particular, acknowledge the teams that, that helped to develop the technology and generate these data sets. So I'd like to highlight the work of the Precision Analytics Systems uh, Reagents Product Development Team and our IT delivery teams in Vancouver really a, a fantastic set of scientists and researchers uh, really working at the cutting edge of, of developing these technologies. I also wanted to highlight some of our collaborators, and especially Dr. Robin Shattuck at, at ICL Imperial College London and Dr. Yvonne Perry at the University of Strathclyde, both of whom that we've worked and, and collaborated with, um, uh, particularly around the, the vaccine applications. Uh, also, also wanted to highlight the, the additional PNI departments involved in all of this work. You know, a, a, a large company, a, a great wider team, uh, uh, encompassing a, a wide range of, of, of knowledge in the area of lipid nanoparticles, and finally funding support that we've received from from the government of Canada. So I'll leave things there, and uh, would be uh, I'm happy to take some questions in the remaining time. So with that, I think Michael, I'll, I'll turn things uh, back over to you. Yes, indeed. Thank you, Samuel. Thank you for a, a very engaging presentation. Really appreciate your time. Um, but on that note, Samuel, I will...
turn over to you very briefly to say any final words and thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Michael. And, and um, I really just wanted to, to thank all the attendees for uh, your attention. I know this was a long talk and as well, uh, also the nice set of questions. I uh, really appreciate that that interaction and uh, would look forward to following up through our team at, at Precision Nanosystems. So uh, thanks again and have a wonderful rest of the day.